good evening or good morning to some of you who are uh, who are joining us from another part of the world. Uh, my name is Małgorzata Bakalaj Diverge. I am director of academic programs at the Center for Jewish History, and I am truly thrilled to welcome you today to our virtual space to a talk delivered by Sarah Halpern entitled the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee to the Rescue in Shanghai from 1941 to 1951. Tonight's talk is co-sponsored by the JDC archives. Uh, we're very grateful for this collaboration and we know that people from JDC are with us. So saying hi. Um, the Center for Jewish History is a home for the archival collections of five partner institutions. American Jewish Historical Society, American Sephardi Federation, Leo Beck Institute, Yivo Institute for Jewish Research, and Yeshiva University Museum. Together, these collections create the second largest archive of the Jewish experience in the world. It is on evenings like this that we celebrate the interconnectedness of our world and our collections as we meet across time zones to study history, exchange ideas, and together make sense about the world we live in. Sarah Halpern's talk is a great occasion to grasp the breadth of the Jewish experience. Her extensive research on the turbulent decade in JDC's activity in Shanghai brings us new understandings of intricacies of global politics affecting the lives of the individuals. Let me introduce our speaker. Sarah Halpern, um, and I have to say that I'm probably one of the last people who are going to say this in public. Sarah, ha Sarah Halpern is a doctoral candidate in modern Jewish and European history at the Ohio State University and the 2019-20 Association for Jewish Studies Dissertation Completion Fellow. Uh, I have to explain you that uh, I am the last person to say it in public because uh, Sarah's doctoral defense is literally scheduled uh, for early next week. So starting next week, it's going to be uh, Dr. Sarah Halpern that we will be introducing. Her research focuses on 20th century Jewish migration, international humanitarian politics and diplomacy, and citizenship in transnational and global contexts. She is completing her dissertation investigating the tensions between humanitarianisms and geopolitics and how they shape the trajectories of Shanghai's German and Austrian Jewish refugees from 1943 to 1949. Her work has received multiple fellowships and grants, among them Association for Jewish Studies, US uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum, Leo Beck Institute, Social Science Research Council, and German Academic Exchange Service, and many more. Um, so finally, without further ado, let me just, before, I, before we start our presentation, let me just uh, explain that um, we will now watch a pre-recorded talk and Sarah will uh, then join us live for the Q&A portion of our program. Uh, please make sure that you turn your closed captions on uh, so that you can fully enjoy the presentation. Uh, you are welcome to write down your questions throughout the program and throughout the presentation. Uh, just please use the Q&A function because we have disabled the chat function. The Q&A function is visible on the bottom of your screen. Our program is recorded and will be available through the center, uh, center's website and YouTube channel very soon. And we will email you the link to the recording as well so that you can share it with those who didn't make it um, tonight. So now without further ado, I'm going to, uh, to start uh, Sarah's presentation and we will see you after roughly 38 minutes for the Q&A that I'm sure will be exciting. What a pleasure to be here tonight uh, to give the talk over Zoom. I would like to, first I'd like to thank the Association for Jewish Studies for the Digitation Completion Fellowship that, that brings me about my different responsibilities for a year to finish my digitation. And I also would like to thank the Center for Jewish History, the JDC Archives, and the Leo Beck Institute for the co-sponsorship of this talk 
as well as Marlowe for her amazing cooperation to make this event possible. And finally, I would like to thank um, Karen Bader, Ruth Goldman, and Lot Marcus for sharing the family stories for tonight's talk. Next slide, please. Tonight, I will tell a story of the JDC of the Shanghai Office of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, also known as the Joint or the JDC. In February 1946, Moses Levitt, who was the vice chairman of the JDC, and he wrote to Charles Jordan, the current director of the JDC Shanghai Office, and I quote. There is no doubt in my mind that you're having a very exciting time. I do not know of any more complicated post in, um, in the JGC than the one in Shanghai. And from all I gather, you seem to be doing a first week job, end quote. At this time, the Shang Shanghai office was actually halfway through its lifetime, though no one knew when it were closed. I will discuss why Shanghai was possibly one of the most difficult positions for offices in the world in the 1940s. There were two significant reasons for this reputation. First, the New York headquarters barely sent staff to, bit, to visit or work in Shanghai. The senior leadership felt that Shanghai was simply too far and its Jews need were not as great as those in Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. This left Shanghai office largely dependent on some 500 refugee employees to serve to a community of 15,000 adults and 2,000 children. Of course, this did not make the refugees there very happy, but it was what it was. Second, Shanghai was undergoing tremendous political, economic, and social upheavals. Let me illustrate the following regimes which the JDC had to contend with. First, the Shanghai Municipal Council, established in 1854 by the British and other Western powers, controlled Shanghai when the JDC opened its office in 1941. The council dominated Shanghai as a semi-colonial port. The Western powers treaty with China allowed their citizens as well as other borders to live under their respective jurisdictions rather than Chinese, which was actually much hard, harsher. These moves subjugated China for the next century, which would have serious repercussions as, for the JDC, as we will see. Next, after the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, the Japanese took over the entire city and established a puppet government. They were also allied with Nazi Germany, which created a lot of uncertainties for the Jewish refugees. This put the JDC, an American organization, in a position of needing to negotiate with the enemy to, on behalf of the Jewish refugees. During the war, the Shanghai Municipal Council ceased to exist because Britain was, and the United States dissolved their treaties. Thus, turning Shanghai back over to China upon Japan's surrender. At the end of the war, the Japanese surrendered Shanghai to the Chinese nationalist government. The, this end of the century-long foreign occupation produced a whole new set of issues for the JDC and the Jewish refugees, not quite seen before. Finally, the Chinese communists took over the city in 1949. Between the New York headquarters 
part of right in Shanghai and not so urgent than Europe. Multiple political regime changes and a buildable community of Jewish refugees with without nationality or citizenship. The directors of the Shanghai office had to demonstrate that racism, political savvy, and ability and efficacy in response to a range of political and migration challenges in and out of China. Did Shanghai Jewish refugees foresee any of these changes? Certainly not. To them, Shanghai was one of the few places in the world that did not require an entry visa. In 1938, when the Nazis invaded Austria and launched November pogroms. When the Jewish refugees arrived from Europe and learned that Shanghai was divided into concessions, as you can see on the map here, the Red Star, uh, yes, the Red Star um, is where the majority of the Jewish refugees live, country. Compared to the much of the international settlement run by the American and the British, and the French obsession, Hong Kong was largely bombed out as a result of the Battle of Shanghai between the Japanese and Chinese forces in 1937. One of the most significant things that Jewish refugees did upon their arrival was to transform, transform the neighborhood into Little Vienna, full of new housing, cafes, and entertainment venues. But the return to somewhat enormously took time. Because many refugees arrived with very little money, they sought relief from the local Jewish committee. The relief committee was financed mostly, largely by the wealthy Baghdadi Jews like Victor Sassoon and the Kaduri family, as well as the JJC. At the photo show, the committee provided communal kitchens and dining areas. The camps, also known as the Heim, to the refugees were large buildings with public laboratories. The rooms were divided by white sheets to create some sort of privacy. Everyone slept in bunk beds. The tradition was far cry from the middle class like that the Jews lived in Europe. Many went out to find jobs and earn income so they could move out to their own rooms and apartments. In addition to the reconstruction of the neighborhood and dignity, Jewish refugees continued to apply for immigration to the United States. By spring 1941, the United States consulate in Shanghai was overwhelmed, particularly that many applicants spoke German with very basic English. The consulate called the JDC for help. They, they wanted Laura Margolis, who was stationed in Cuba. Not only she was shrewd, charming, and smart, social worker who stood, who understood government bureaucracies. Margola was also fluent in German. In addition, a digital bonus was that she was behind the scene in handling the SSD Lewis crisis in 1938, though she was a perfect candidate for the job. The JDC agreed and transferred her to Shanghai in May 1941. Spacebar, please. Once Mongolia arrived, she took a tour of Tongshu. The tradition opposed her. Immediately, she wrote to the New York headquarters to tell them that the refugee situation was required professional social workers, not amateur. Space bar, please. Quote, either you send Manny here or someone else, but this is not a problem that I can handle alone or else I will come home, end quote. 
Mandy seated with her colleague in Cuba. The JDC agreed and began to the process of sending him to Shanghai. While waiting for Seedle's survival, Margolis, um, Margolis began to organize layout of groundwork for the relief and the work of the JDC. She organized committees, hired approximately 500 refugees, established a school for children, and, and, and set up a larger kitchen to feed over 8,000 people a day. She also established the Shanghai Refugee Hospital because there was dozens of medical professions who, that could easily build the staff roster. One aspect of the hospital was struggled with, that the hospital struggled with to get enough medication. Shanghai tropical and unsanitary condition caused the many refugees to become, become um, seriously ill at one point or another. It's sad, including Dr. Marcus, who was 14 then, had to go out to the Chinese pharmacy to get what they needed. They had to improvise as much as they could, including setting up an, a free outdoor drop-in clinic. In addition, Margolis made socializing with the Japanese a priority. Because of Japan's alliance with Germany, Margolis was, wanted the Japanese to sympathize with the Jewish refugees flight and not bow down to the Nazis' anti-Jewish policies. She deplored it, she hated going to these social events and making small talks, but she would do anything for the Jewish refugees. Her strategy paid off. The success was made evident by how Margolis prepared for the continuation of the relief operation under the Japanese occupation. The Japanese took over the entire city of Shanghai in December 8, 1941, but they did not make any immediate changes to the city because of how complex Shanghai's political, social, and economic situation was. One exception was that the one exception that directly affected the JDC was the freezing of American and British bank accounts. At this point, Margolis and Seidel went to every Jew in town to collect IOUs. At the JDC headquarters was quite wrapped up with the worsening situation in Europe. In addition, Margolis organized a group of Russian Jews who were neutral to take over the relief operation in case of international, I mean, in case of um, internment of allied citizens. The pair also conducted the committee with the local representative of the International Red Cross. The Red Cross as a neutral organization was necessary for communication and monetary transfers. These efforts, bandied notwithstanding, enabled, enabled the Jewish refugees to basically survive the war. Everything changed a year later. The British and Americans dissolved their treaty with China in January 1943 effectively ending Shanghai's status at the treaty port. The Japanese saw this as a reason to intern Allied citizens. Margolis and Seidel each went to an internment camp by the end of February 1943. On the 18th of February, the Japanese issued a proclamation stating that all stateless Europeans, in quote, might move into a designated area because of military necessity by the 18th of May of 1943. In other words, nearly all German, Austrian, and Czech Jews 
who lived who arrived in Shanghai after 1937 had to be combined into a ghetto. Imagine this. 17,000 Jewish refugees living among some 50,000 Chinese with, within one square mile. The uh, depending, dependency on the JDC for food and medical assistance grew each month. And our just basic became stars and the refugees lost their jobs and ways of, for income. It did not mean that the operation went smoothly. The Japanese dismissed the committee members and put on and replaced them with corrected Russian Jews in charge. Communication was completely cut off because the Japanese banned and shortwave videos and stopped all the mail. The last word is that the Jewish refugees in Shanghai got from Europe when the news of deportation to Poland in 1942. The Japanese also mismanaged Shanghai economic, economy, affecting the supplies of food, medicine, utilities, and coal. The condition of the ghetto deteriorated so much that by spring 1945, 12,000 Jewish refugees were on relief, up from 8,000 in 1941. Without Margolis returned to the United States in fall 1943, feeding and caring for 12,000 people would not have been possible. Upon Margolis' initial internment, the United New York headquarters interceded with the United States government to place them on the list for the prisoner of war exchange with Japan. The government was only able to get Margolis out. Margolis returned to New York and then went to Washington to testify on the tradition of Jewish refugees in Shanghai to the government, including the Congress and the Treasury Department. Her eyewitness report convinced the officials to allow the JDC to set up a monthly transfer of $100,000 to Shanghai via the International Red Cross, who, which forwarded the money onto its representative in Shanghai. The representative then turned the money over to the committee in charge of the refugees. These monies arrived just when the bond that was collected in 1942 were running very low in spring 1944. By this point, the committee had shut down the new groups, cash allowances, and other social services just to be able to be people. This included the hospital. The camps, which had 2,200 beds, now hosted 4,000 individuals. During the war, just over 1,000 Jewish refugees died, many of them of old age or diseases. In early August 1945, Seidel, who was living across the river in the Putong camp, learned that the refugee situation was reaching its reaching a uh, breaking point. He chose to escape. The Japanese soldiers saw the defeat coming and paid little attention to their surroundings. When Seidel arrived, he resumed his position as the director of the JDC Shanghai office and dissolved the corrupted committee. To raise morale among the refugees, Seidel restarted and expanded so services that had ceased in, in, in 1943, including the hospital and the school. However, Seidel had a problem. He had no fund to pay for everything, and the ablation was spiraling out of control. Not too long after the Japanese surrender, 
The American and the Chinese troops arrived to the bridge Shanghai. The Americans provided Seattle and the refugees with much needed morale to up uplift and resources. The military sent Shanghai of Seattle's SOS people to the New York headquarters to let them know that he needed cash immediately. Groups of GI took tour of Hong Kong to assess the situation and inform Seattle of a new international organization called the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, known as UNDROP. Finally, they told Seattle that the Chinese nationalists were in, now in charge, not the Western powers. Theodore concluded that the livelihood of the refugees now depended on the goodwill of the Chinese nationalists. The Chinese nationalists initially had no plans to care for the Jewish refugees. The government was far more concerned about the welfare of upward of 80 million Chinese nearly 20% of them displaced by the war, which was known as the Sino-Japanese War from 1937 to 1945. There had been um, the country, the third largest in the world, also needed significant agricultural and industrial reconstruction. As a result, the JDC worked with the UNDRA to convince the government to contribute a from its national relief program. It was now no mean by an easy task because the Jewish refugees were in a gray area. On the one hand, the Chinese viewed them as white borders, a reminder of the Western imperialism. The fact that the refugees were stateless and dependent on the JDC for protection made them easy targets for harassment on the streets. On the other hand, the leader, Chiang Kai-shek, was well aware of the Jewish refugees' predicament as a victim diaspora with no, internet or no national state to call home. Sato was aware of the delicate position that the Jewish refugees were in. In December 1945, when the Chinese authorities took their first tour of Hong Kong and questioned the refugees about their future plans, Sato regrets that the goodwill was traditional. He wrote to the York headquarters, quote, well, I don't understand that basically the sovereignty of the Chinese with regards to the question must be upheld. On the other hand, it does seem as though this group it does need special consideration and special treatment, end quote. The Chinese officials aided to perturb him, particularly with regard to how they compare the JDC generous support to other relief and charitable organizations catered to the non-Jews, especially a lot of the Chinese. Seattle's fears for the Jewish refugees materialized in the following month when his disaster, Charles Jordan, reported the harassment of the Jewish refugees by the Chinese residents over housing. Housing was, housing shortages were always a problem in Shanghai, but it became even more acute when the war ended. When the Jewish refugees arrived in 1938, Shanghai had a population of 4 million. In 1945, the number rose to 5 million because of Chinese war refugees seeking aid and the employment in Shanghai. And that number would continue to rise because of the Chinese civil war that was occurring up in the northern part of China 
the increase in population was just one problem for the JDC. The other was the fact that the Japanese population in 1943 displaced hundreds of Chinese who were forced to give up their rooms to the Jewish refugees. In 1945, these displaced Chinese demanded the return of their properties. In addition, Chinese landlords were inflated rent. The Jewish refugees had no money to move except to go to the JDT camps. The fight over housing symbolized the Chinese nationalistic desire to reclaim what they thought belonged to them. How did Jordan solve this quandary? It was not easy. He obtained concept huts as seen on the um, on the right for the overflow from the camps and the hospital. He also obtained the building for the age as seen on the left. Otherwise, Jordan spent much of 1946 breaking up arguments between Jewish refugees and the Chinese residents because the old Chinese Ch Shanghai police were not interested in intervening in conflict between their own and the white borders, white people. Um, he negotiated and renegotiated with the Chinese property owners. Although the Chinese nationalist government didn't grant his refugees um, legal protection as part of an international agreement, the reality proved it otherwise. As such, Jordan had to make promises to the Chinese authorities and the residents that many of the Jewish refugees would emigrate from, or leave from Shanghai by early 1947. Now we're talking about six months. Jordan recognized the enormity of the task of getting 15,000 Jewish refugees to leave Shanghai as quickly as possible. He set up the migration department, which is photographed here, to act as a middleman between the consulates and the refugees. Many refugees spoke no or little English, and Jordan did not want them to be bothering the consulates. He hired Morris Bader, a refugee from Czechoslovakia. Bader was one of those who Jordan trusted, who spoke multiple languages, including fluent English. Bader was also a very effective administrator. He knew many of the cases from his previous job in the State Person Bureau under the Japanese puppet government. While Bader processed hundreds of cases per month with a staff of 30, Jordan focused on the negotiations with the United Nations, uh, States and Australia. Jewish refugees top choices for resettlement. While American Jewish organization exercised political advocacy and only needed Jordan's recourse, Australian Jews were a different story. Jordan sent a former JDC representative who worked at the Andra in China, Jerud Vincent, to Australia in December 1946. Her job was to meet with the Minister for Immigration and the Australian Jewish leaders and establish a stronger um, connection between them and the JDC. Her effort only got Jordan only so far. The migration did not go fast enough, which, which I can explain in the Q&A. The Australian Jewish leaders also maintained tactic silence on the Jewish migration to Australia out of fear of anti-Semitism. By August 1947, Jordan was fed up and visited Australia for himself. 
morality achieved no immediate results. He came away with a deeper appreciation for the Minister for Immigration, who was a humanitarian at heart, and the complexity of the Australian national politics. The Minister for Immigration gave Jordan the confidence that he needed to push even more applications for Australia. Much to the annoyance of his nemesis in the Australian consulate, OCG, OCW Berman. And Jordan Berman frequently argued over Berman's deliberate efforts to block Jewish immigration to Australia. Jordan departed from his new position at the head of the Immigration Department in the JDC European headquarters in Milibaldus. His successor, Adolf Westfold, was to finish the migration job. While Jordan left in April 1948, over 7,000 Jewish refugees had departed from Shanghai to the United States, Australia, Europe, and South America. Westfold arrived in on the job with the goal of closing down the JDC while helping Jewish refugees gain financial independence again. To fulfill his duties, Russell first strengthened the rehabilitation program as businesses in the refugee community closed it as a result of emigration. Second, he oversaw the uh, evacuation of over 2,000 Jewish refugees in the late 1948 to 1950 to Israel, Canada, Germany, and Austria. He organized for, I quote, seal trains, schemes which allowed the refugees to travel through the United States without visas for onward journey to Europe and Israel. These, these itineraries were very controversial, but necessary he called the Suez Canal a close, and the journey around Africa proved to be too much physically and about men mentally. I'm really, there's a whole story in there. I would be happy to talk about it in the Q&A as well. Finally, when the Chinese com uh, communists took over China in October 1949, Russell began arranging for the continuing care of the elderly and the ill. There were two options. First was to send those able to travel to Germany and Austria, which have better marital facilities than Israel or Shanghai. The refugee hospital was winding down quickly because many of the staff were had left to set resettle elsewhere. Seven, were to form a group um, of Jews willing to stay in Shanghai under the communist rule to look after some look after some three hundred people. The council of the Jewish committee um, collected monthly funds from the JGC ran programs and existed with the Jews with their immigration from China. Among the people it helped were Noah Goldman and his young son, Robert. Noah had become partially blind to the cataracts and distrusted the council now that the JDC was gone. That's how much the JDC mattered in the way of obtaining the refugee trust. It took much persuasion for Noah to leave Shanghai to join his daughter in Scotland in 1958 with Robert and Cho. The council disbanded shortly after. But before I conclude, I would like to tell you it's an important story. Russell left in Shanghai in 1951, but not without difficulties. Like other Americans, Russell struggled to get his active visa or active permit from the Chinese authorities. He had to settle all outstanding petty charges against him, um, all the debt that he owed, um, 
and it took them almost a year to leave in fact the council was already running the show when Russell was still waiting for his visa for the extra permit so by the time the the Chinese authorities were ready to hand him the extra permit they gave him a, um, a choice he could either um, leave behind the 20,000 case files, corn sponsors, mammals, all the paperwork that the Shanghai officer collected did not really want. You could leave all those behind and have an active permit, or you could stay in China and protect those papers. So Russell had to make a very difficult choice. He really wanted to send all the papers over to the United States, but the authority were not allowing him to. So Russell made this fateful decision. He chose to come back to the United States without all the paper. And it is, and we don't know where we are, that where it all where it all is today. And it is personally, I I'm just waiting for the stretch of drove to hopefully appear. As long as it had to been destroyed, I mean I just can't um, imagine how you know how rich the information would be. So um just just to let you know we we're still looking we're waiting for the chinese authorities to tell us who knows anyway in conclusion moses levitt who we noted that the money in the shanghai office was one of the most difficult jobs in 1946 it was correct it remained true to last world's departure in 1951 under the communist pressure, Russell, Margolis, Seidel, and Jordan each tackled political, economic, and social challenges that um, confronted them and the Jewish refugees. They demonstrated pragmatism in their mitigation with various authorities who clearly exhibited prejudice toward Jews whether because of their whiteness or Europeanness, or ethnicity or race and juice. What mattered, what, I mean, what remained consistent throughout the story of the JDC in Shanghai office what is the reputation that it built for itself. It was not only the American money we used to care for the Jewish refugees that mattered, but it was also how politically savvy the directors were in their management of their charge with the goal of helping them survive and leave Shanghai for new and better lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, that was uh, that was quite a treat. Uh, so thank you for for this. Uh, while, because I see that people are uh, asking the questions, while we're waiting for people to write them down, um, can you tell us what you didn't tell us during the presentation? Sure. Um, I think the two things that I uh, wanted to have a little bit more time to talk about, uh, one of them is why the migration to Australia was very slow, um, and it is you know, it is important to be aware of um, the kind of environment that the JDC was working in at the time, trying to move the refugees out of Shanghai very quickly. And Australia was, I mean, to Jordan's view, was just, you know, if not the United States, the Jewish refugees should go to Australia. I've been there, I, 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 just, I agree with them. It's a beautiful country, beautiful people, very nice, and big thing. But um, the problem was Australia in the 1940s was very, um, had a very small diplomatic corps. It had just, it was a British colony and it had become a British dominion. But until 1940, the British had taken over all the Australian foreign affairs. But at that from 1940 onward, um, Australia took independent, independent dishes. 
So by night fun time, the war ended. Australia barely had an infrastructure of the diplomatic corps. So in Shanghai, there was no immigration officer. There was nobody specialized in immigration. So, so you imagine this one consulate, you know, uh, one consul officer who trying to manage the job plus the immigration papers. So that's part of the reason why it was a little slow. But specifically, in the 1947, Canberra, which was the capital of Australia, was not so quick to give out the land permits for the con um, prosperity legislation. I mean, legislate, legislate um, at the time because at the summer system in Australia was very high, and these it was huge um, towards the press. It was really the press and a couple of government officials who made very loud noises. And the Minister of Immigration at the time bought the Canberra was very sensitive. And I just thought part of the problem was, well, there were a couple of problems. One, which is all the publicity around a couple of ships that had come in, both from Shanghai and Europe, that had large, large Jewish passengers, um, a large load of Jewish passengers. And incidentally, both of them had come to Sydney, which is on the east side of Australia, rather than Perth, which is on the west side, and is much more desolate than the east side. So you imagine the visual of all the Jews coming off the ships in a more populated area of Australia, as opposed to less populated area of Australia where no Jewish migrants from Europe came in. So the image was a very big deal. Number two, you have to say the, con the legislation was very short-staffed and there was nobody definite who were experienced enough to handle all the immigration paperwork. And that's where Berman came in in 1947, I mean, in July, 1947. And that's where the argument began. Um, so there's that backlog of cases. Finally, it's shipping it was very scarce at the time. The it was just not enough boats to go around, and of course, part of the problem with that because of the pressure that Carwell base he had um, to impose twenty five percent quota on the ships mm. meant that only twenty five percent of the passengers had to be Jewish, not any more. Now that was a real problem by the day to see. So. Migration in that period was very slow for all those reasons. And when Berman came along, he didn't make the situation any better. Mm. Thank you for that. I think that it is important for us to, um, to understand how different factors are at, at, at stake and how some of them are extremely political and some of them are very practical. Uh, I think that this is this is really illuminating to, to have this complex perspective. Uh, so thank you for this. Let's start reading the questions. I think that we will, I would like to make an announcement that those of our attendees who are interested in sharing their stories with Sarah Halpern are welcome to email her and we will be happy to help with this contact. So please contact us after the program and we will be happy to put you in touch with, uh, with Sarah Halpern. But for lack of time, we are not going to develop on these, on these questions right now. Okay, so uh, question number one. Have you done any research in uh, Tianjin where my husband and family lived? Have you done um, any research on Tianjin? Uh, no, I personally have not. Although I have seen a lot of files, a number of documents. Um, in much the day to see, but trying to deal with the Jewish meeting there. Um, it is the whole interesting story, especially in 1948, 49. Um, and it's just incredible um, that these people had a mind of their own. Um, well, you know, I didn't mean mind of their own. The JDC, was, the, the JDC was very clear in trying to tell them, no, 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 no. You need to borrow our rules. We're trying to get you out. 
but we have reason why we do this. But the Jewish, uh, the Jewish intention was not so much on that. But certainly there is a wonderful talk by a Borman JGC fellow. Did you have a video of her uh, doing that kind of talk? You can check out archives.jdc.org and it should be a video somewhere. I know I have her name right off the top of my head, but I just don't quite remember, but why don't you just check out on the website because she have a video on that. Thank you for that. Do you know why the Japanese did not attack Shanghai as they did in Nanking? Didn't Laura Margolis intercede with the Japanese commandant or uh, of the refugee area for more food and supplies? Um, well, part of it was the Nanking. Nanjing was not a treaty port. It was really a Chinese city. But Shanghai was an international port and it was divided among the, um, the powers. Um, and you can be recalled the map. There was an international settlement and the French session. They were controlled by Western powers. And for the Japanese, they were not, they, the Japanese were aware of how powerful the British and the Americans were in 1937. And they were, at the time, they were not interested in attacking them in any way. And what they were more interested in colonizing, the Japanese were much more interested in colonizing China. And with them, they were very aware of how they were going to take over Shanghai. Well, that's why Shanghai was, in 1937, after the battle ended, that's why it was all the Chinese areas were taken over by the Japanese. But as I said, um, for international diplomacy reasons, the Japanese were not interested in touching those other areas. So it was only in 1941, after Japan attacked the United States and the United States declared war on Japan and of course the British declared war on Japan. So that's when the Japanese were more comfortable intervening, well, um, taking over the international session. Now, the international settlement. Now, for the French, because remember, well, I don't know if you know this, but in Japan was day alive with Germany, which meant Germany was day alive with Vichy France. And Vichy agreed with the Japanese to give up the French powers in Shanghai shortly after the United States and the British pulled back on the treaties. So that's the part. So that's why Japan, the Japanese were eventually able to take over the whole city of Shanghai in 1941, 42, and so on. So can you speak about the major archives which you access apart from the JDC archives in New York City and Jerusalem, and which you found to be the most relevant? Um, well, my, um, aside from the JDC archive, which is my most favorite place in the world, um, I also loved working in the United Nations archives, which is actually right around the corner from the JDC in New York. Um, and also the, um, the Archives National, who are National Archives in Paris. And they do contain the records of the United Nations, the Relief and Refugee Agencies. Why there are any different archives? I have no idea. I, mean, I can't even explain. Um, but those are the biggest repertories for me. Um, I also have found a lot of material, wonderful material in the National Archives of Australia, um, in beautiful Canberra. So I've had, well, those are the big, I mean, that's where, it's what I, one of the things I did argue in my dissertation is that the Jewish refugees often felt that they had been forgotten by the world. But the truth was, there was thousands and thousands of papers relating to their tradition, their faith, anything to them. So just because it's not um, in their sight, the bureaucrat was certainly talking about them behind the doors. <laughs>
So that's where a lot of the material came from. Perhaps you could you could just briefly connect, uh, uh, refer to the question uh, that I'm about to read, um, and tell us a little bit more about the Spielmann Committee. Uh, it existed when Margalit arrived uh, with JDC funding, and she basically reformed it. Um, can you maybe comment, maybe really really briefly about it, because it looks like we have a lot of more questions to cover. I, I'm afraid we're not going to be able to address all of them tonight. Now the latter material, uh, I mean, last story. Um, as the Spielman Committee, um, I really can't comment too much on it because um, this is a little bit before my um, deep, where I really go into the research into the story. Um, but it was really just being a committee which just, um, you know, the foundation serious refugees and providing uh, relief services for the refugees. Mm -hmm. And they were mostly amateur um, social workers. I mean, actually they were not professional social workers, but they're merely um, resident of Shanghai who's just trying to help the refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a f quite a few questions that are uh, asked by people intrigued by the topic of your research. So do you have any familiar connection with Shanghai or the Shanghai refugees? No, actually no, no, no connection. I'm, as mm -hmm. far as I'm aware, all my family left for the United States by 1930, 1913. So where does the, this topic come from? Oh my gosh. Um, actually, it came, I've always been interested in the Holocaust. And I, you know, it used to be memoirs. And now, I mean, my grandmother introduced me to the topic, actually. Um, but by the time um, I was 18, I was just getting tired of all the stories of the camps. So I just went into Amazon, which was way back then, just a bookstore. Um, and it just came up with a memoir called Shanghai Diary. Um, a young girl in, I don't remember the full title. I don't think I even have it on my bookshelf. Um, and it's about Ursula Baden. It's very well bidden. She's very, she passed away some time ago. I read it and I was just blown away. And um, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I need to know Chinese for this. So uh, I just put it back in my head. And um, then I was thinking, eventually became interested in the American Jewish response to the Holocaust. And one of the cities, one of the case studies I explored was San Francisco. And when I came, I never realized. And I was researching San Francisco's history. The, if San Francisco was the port of entry in the United States from, for both from Asia, then the Shanghai Jewish refugees must have come to move San Francisco rather than New York. So it turned out I was correct. Do you really think that those JDC papers still exist? Um, well, I, I am optimist. So I do believe that they are very, very, very deep, deep, deep in perhaps the Shanghai Municipal Archive. Um, but my only concern is the Cultural Revolution in China that was in the 1960s, which this is why a lot of papers, a lot of, you know, pretty much eight then hours of the past. Um, I mean, I certainly can't imagine these papers end up, though time papers, the JDC materials ended up in Taiwan when the nationalists left there in 1949. So I'm pretty, I'm confident that it's somewhere inside Shanghai. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you're optimistic uh, about it. There are not that many scholars who are optimists. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, can you tell us more about the role uh, of the Sassoon family uh, and uh, in helping JDC? Sure. This actually is funny because I just finished reading the book by, um, what's his name? Something Kaufman called The Last King of Shanghai. When fifth assessment, he was the big man of Shanghai and he had all the money. He actually bankrolled the national government. So they 
No, she was. Yes. And believe it was a push. Uh, the Jewish refugees, you know, I mean, the Jewish community, as well as the Chinese authorities, to help all the Jewish refugees who were coming in. And for Sassen, he was actually in a very difficult political position because the Japanese were also interested in him. They were interested in his connection to the United States. So they, so for Sassen, he would, you had to walk a, a, a tight rope between keeping the Japanese happy, but also helping the Jewish refugees. So he tried very hard to give all the money and, but his role was not just about money, but more about taking over the diplomacy um, in order to save the Jewish refugees. Um, I mean, Margoli was certainly not the only one, but Sachin really got the Japanese and looking at the Jewish refugees in a positive way as opposed to the Nazis. So Sachin was more of a diplomat where Kandori, of course, Kandori was more of a philanthropist in which he was the one who visited the refugees and helped to set up a school. He just loved being around them. So we had two different uh, wealthy men taking care of them in different ways. How did the, did the change over from UNRWA to IRO have a great impact on the refugee situation in Shanghai? Um, so, um, in terms of those, no, not as dramatic, but it did create a lot of problems for the JJC in Shanghai at the time because the IRO was not, because the JDC was already on the wall with the migration, immigration. And so the UNDA was already paying for everything on time, but the IRO just wanted to keep it up. So they had to, so from the JDC's office perspective, on the ground, everything stayed the same. But so where in terms of getting paid back, that was different. So the JDC was always sending receipts saying, you still owe us money? You still owe us money. So that's where you see the dramatic change. Thank you very much. Um, I think we don't have much more time. So uh, I think that was the, the, the last question that you addressed tonight. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, there were a lot of questions that were concerning family uh, issues. As I said before, we would be very happy to uh, help with uh, putting you attendees in touch with Sarah Halpern. So please send us an email and we will be happy to forward it to Sarah. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, thank you very much to those who stayed with us. I understand that tonight is a, also a hot political night. So it's a good thing that we have priorities here. Uh, it was a great pleasure. Thank you very much to the JDC archives who, uh, that uh, co-sponsored this program. Please consider um, supporting us uh, and donating uh, so that we can have even more interesting programs like the one tonight. Um, and as I said uh, before in the introduction, we, are, we have been recording this program so uh, once we process the video, you will receive a link from us uh, over the email. Um, for now, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evening.